Martin, Celebrity Roast, coming to you from the MGM Grand Hotel in the entertainment capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. Ladies and gentlemen, from the beautiful Ziegfeld Room, tonight's star-studded roast has brought together some of the world's greatest entertainers. They've come from all over the world to be here tonight, here in Las Vegas, in person. Your Roastmaster, Dean Martin. And tonight's very special Man of the Week, Rick Chamberlain. Tonight, we honor one of the greatest basketball players of all time, Mr. Wilt Chamberlain. But before we begin, let us have a moment of silence for the stagehand who said to Wilt before the show, You got business here, boy? <laughs> In 1936, Will Chamberlain came into this world. He was even tall at birth. He was so tall, he was born on August 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. <laughs> at an early age, his only interest in life was basketball, but he couldn't afford to buy one, so he used to go down to the schoolyard and dribble a white kid. <laughs> Mm. Today, Wilt drives a gold Rolls Royce, but he's no fool. When he drives through Georgia, he changes places with his white chauffeur. <laughs> well, a lot of your friends and admirers couldn't be here tonight, but they sent telegrams. Even the owner of the Lakers sent you a wire. No telegram, just a wire. <laughs> Norm Crosby is one comedian who takes show business seriously. He's dedicated, he's involved, he's committed. At least he should be. Ladies and my pal, a real funny guy, Mr. Norm Crosby. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. Uh, well, Chamberlain is an insulation to young people all over the world. <laughs> Wherever he appears, after every game, the kids give him a standing ovulation. That's the truth. <laughs> so he's tall. Big deal. That's a joke. <laughs> people can overcome handicaps if they have drive and ambition. I knew a pickpocket once in Boston. This is the truth. Had only one finger. One finger Louie was a pickpocket. Can you imagine? And he did pretty good, too. Of course, all he ever stole were bagels and donuts. <laughs> but Will can remember, all of us can, grown-up guys. We never had the advantages in sports like the kids have today. We never had little league with fancy uniforms and regulation ballparks. We played ball in a dirty, vacant lot where first base was a rock, second base was a garbage can cover, and third base was a wino who was always laying drunk in the grass. <laughs> I heard he became a big singer. <laughs> it's hard to believe when you look at a, a big guy like Wilt, but that whole body, truly, is only worth 98 cents. It's incredible, but it's true. A laboratory optician proved in a laboratory that the whole body, chemically distended, is only worth 98 cents. And that's why bigotry is such a joke. What difference does it make? Black, white, yellow, green, man or woman, nobody can possibly be better than anybody else. The whole body, 98 cents. 98 cents, a whole body. Some girls get more, you know. <laughs> well, good luck in San Diego, we're going to miss it. Hey, 
Thank you, Lawrence. Besides being one of Wilt's closest friends, Happy Harrison is one of the reasons that the Lakers have such a great ball club. He's a tall one, too. He has to bend down every time he walks under McDonald's golden arches. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, superb athlete, Mr. Happy Harrison. Thank you very much, Dean. You know, when you play on a team with a guy a number of years, as I have played with Wilt, you get to know him pretty well. And I get burned up when I hear things about Wilt. Things that I know for a fact are not true. For instance, you may have heard that on the court, Wilt is a very selfish player. Nonsense. He's the most generous basketball player I know. I never saw anyone give away as many championship games as Wilt. <laughs> Some of the black movies criticize Wilt for not changing his name, like uh, Muhammad uh, Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar have done. But they don't understand Wilt. It's not that Wilt Chamberlain isn't willing to change his name. It's just that there's only one name that he'd rather have, and that's already been taken. Bill Russell. <laughs> Well, really, what I want to tell you, the Lakers won't be the same this year without you. I'm going to miss you. I know that's for sure. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking of changing my name from happy to ecstatic. <laughs> Thank you, Happy. There's a lady with us tonight who's going to review Wilt Chamberlain's new book in the Saturday Review of Literature, Miss Roberta... Push. Thank you, Mr. Martin. And good evening, lovers of good literature. And if there are any of you here tonight, what are nice people like you doing in a dump like this? <laughs> I would like to review a new book. Oh, uh, this is a book, Dean. You can tell this from the magazines that you read because there isn't any centerfold. <laughs> now, I usually review nonfiction novels of cultural significance, but when this book reached our office, there was such a clamor about who would get to review it that we had to draw straws. I lost. <laughs> this is called Wilt, just like any other seven-foot black millionaire who lives next door. It's the kind of book that you just can't put down until you finish the title. <laughs> it is uh, listed as an autobiography of Wilt Chamberlain as told to David Shaw. Or to put it in your language, Dean, David Shaw is the book or, and Wilt Chamberlain is the book E. <laughs> Now, first, let's discuss what the book is about. It's about six ninety-five. Uh, <laughs> batteries not included, of course. It is shockingly antisocial. It takes Wilt Chamberlain three hundred and ten pages to say what Dean Martin can say with a single Italian hand gesture. <laughs> Here in California, it's going just like wildfire. Everybody's burning it. <laughs> I want you to hear the first chapter. See Wilt run. <laughs> run, Wilt, run. Run, run, run. They don't write them like that anymore. <laughs> Now, sports writers have called Wilt Chamberlain a whiner because he alibis so much. He alibis about losing. He alibis about fighting with teammates. He alibis about voting for Nixon. Well, <laughs> what this book really is, is an alibiography. <laughs> and uh, 
It also tells us how he can palm a basketball in each hand. And it also tells us why he's so popular with Raquel Welch. Yeah! <laughs> This book tells us really a lot more than we care to know about Will Chamberlain. <laughs> uh, somewhere in the last chapter, Wilt, with characteristic modesty, reveals that he doesn't care whether anybody likes this book or not, because he has lots of other irons in the fire. Wilt, I suggest that you put this book with the other irons. <laughs> That was Audrey Meadows. Thank you, Audrey. Ladies and gentlemen, a fine talent and a real pro, Mr. Ken Perry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dean. I'm here tonight as a basketball fan, and I have been a fan ever since I was knee-high to Wilt Chamber. <laughs> this was day before yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Some things never change. When they're trying to choose the greatest sports figure of all time, my vote goes to Wilt Chamberlain. Of course, I also voted for McGovern. <laughs> like Goldwater and Al Flander and all those guys. Uh, this time, I think I've really got a winner. And I resent some of the scurrilous things they've been saying about this amazingly gifted, colossal klutz. <laughs> Is he coming after me yet? <laughs> T tonight, I would like to put the lie to some of these rumors. They, they say that Wilt exaggerates his success with the ladies. Well, what does it take to be successful with the ladies, really? Only that a man be tall, dark, and handsome. <laughs> well, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> They say he's extravagant with his money because he has four different limousines. The fact is, he needs four cars, one for each direction. <laughs> <laughs> well, why does he need such big cars like Rolls Royces and Bentleys? Well, they're the only cars with glove compartments big enough for his watermelons. <laughs> Such a good time, so <laughs> his best shot is the hook. Ask any of the great hookers. <laughs> and they'll also tell you about Wilt's wham bam, thank you, ma'am, slam dunk. <laughs> but if I do nothing else here tonight, if I do nothing else here tonight, <laughs> and I'm sure many of you are hoping that I do nothing else here tonight, I want to set the record straight on one thing. It was not Wilt Chamberlain who sold out to Adolf Hitler. It was Neville Chamberlain. Congratulations. <laughs> well, you can. Tonight we are very pleased to have with us one of the most respected officials in the NBA. He was the first black man to become professional Basketball referee, would you all please welcome Mr. Rudolph Mendy. And he told me I was the first black referee. Of course, that was not because they thought I had such knowledge of sports. It's because they wanted to save money. You think this is a shirt? No, I just painted the white stripes on my body. <laughs> they said that they were afraid that I would favor the black players in my officiating. Not so. I would never discriminate against a white basketball player. I know what it is to be a minority. <laughs> between black referees and white referees except this one. In addition to this signal, which means jump ball, and this signal, which means foul, we have this signal, 
which means you're out of the game, white boy. <laughs> I say that there are some players who try to intimidate referees. Not Will. Not Will. I've had the occasion to witness how polite and what gentlemanly conduct he can have. He came up to me, he said, a referee, I'd like to suggest that your perception of my involvement in that imbroglio was somewhat faulty. I said, you're right, Will. As a matter of fact, I think I reversed my decision. He said, thank you, sir. And with that, he released my ears and dropped me to the floor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here's a man who's broken more records than any other jockey in the history of racing, Mr. Bill Schumacher. You know, there's something I'm going to reveal tonight that the public, for, to the public for the first time. Will Chamberlain and I are identical twins. <laughs> we were only six months old. Gypsy stole my brother Will from our baby carriage. And even though we were separated, we grew up with identical tastes. It's like the Corsican brothers. We both grew up to be riders. I ride horses. He rides referees. <laughs> when I go out for a race, I wear green boots, a broad yellow sash, a scarlet tunic with a fluffy ascot and a checkered cap with a pom-pom on top. That's the way Will dresses when he goes out on a date. <laughs> Brother Will, stand up and let me shake your hand. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Mr. Vernon Scott writes for every big newspaper and magazine in the country. He writes for them, but they never send him any. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of the finest journalists in America, United Press reporter, Vernon Scott. <laughs> Jim Murray of the Los Angeles Times described uh, Wilt legitimately as fickle. Arrogant, lazy, irascible, demanding, petulant, mercenary, and unappreciative. But in defense of Wilt, I must say, he also has his faults. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to hand it to Wilt Chamberlain. Because, as his coach will tell you, if you pass it to him, he'll drop it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the most respected actor, Mr. George Kennedy. Thank you, Dean. As every basketball fan knows, Will Chamberlain is a seven foot one and a half inches tall in his stocking feet, or seven foot one and a quarter inches tall without his patty hose. <laughs> People should really try to be more sensitive and understanding of Wilt's situation. They should be more considerate of his feelings. It's, it's not easy being a gangling freak. <laughs> First of all, it's almost impossible to buy clothes. He can't even find knee pads that fit him. He has to find a 44D cup and cut it in two. <laughs> The world doesn't present many opportunities to a man who's seven feet tall and black. I mean, what choice did Will have? He could either become a basketball player or an exclamation point on a billboard. <laughs> and on top of all of this, he has to put up with endless jibes and ridicule. Why do we make fun of a tall man? I asked a psychiatrist friend of mine, and he told me because deep down we're afraid that the tall man is sexually superior. But I find that hard to understand. I mean, if Wilt makes love like he shoots free throws, we ain't got nothing to worry about. <laughs> Thank you. 
enjoy. Jackie Gale is a comedian who just returned from a 20-city tour of the United States to apologize for his last appearance on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a comedian who's moving up fast, Mr. Jackie Gale. I'm still working on a watermelon in a glove compartment. <laughs> and it's an honor to be here for Mr. Chamberlain. Of course, he comes from a very illustrious family. I remember his uncle when he was Prime Minister of England. <laughs> he's a wonderful man. And why should anybody want to roast him this day? Who has he offended lately? <laughs> That's right. Just remember the good days when you sung two free throws in a row. They sent the ball out for drug analysis. <laughs> I like to say. And a lot of people here roasting him. Bill Shoemaker. How could you roast this man? Wasn't he the one who told the witch doctor to shrink you? <laughs> and when things were rough, he let you sleep in his glove. <laughs> I'll say one thing for you. You got a great riding technique. All you do is whisper in the horse's ear, glue factory, glue factory. <laughs> I see Ken Berry here from F Troop. He had Mayberry RFB. That's right, the all American boy, Ken Berry. I love him. If you put a slot on the side of me, become a ride at Disneyland. <laughs> That's a good line. You think about it, it sneaks up. That's those sneak lines. And George Kennedy. Who lost his TV series. A lot of guys that lose that series. This must be the show's a rest home for cancellations. <laughs> George, I loved you in Cool Hand Luke. I love that name, Cool Hand Luke. It sounds like a frozen Chinese dinner. <laughs> but you know, George did win an Academy Award. Big deal. So did Louise Rayner. And where is she now? An Avon lady in Vienna. This stuff is good. It may get me another shot. <laughs> and I noticed that Georgia hair's getting a little white. That happened while he was filming Airport when he found out Dean was the pilot. <laughs> and I'll tell you something. That would have bleached Nipsey Russell. <laughs> Nipsey, you look a little familiar. You look like a jockey out on the lawn in front of Will's house. <laughs> Him, the only teammate they could dig up to show up for him. <laughs> and Happy had an offer from the other league, too, from the Bakersfield Bumblebees. <laughs> he was offered $30 a game and a box lunch. <laughs> but he's holding out for 40 and some ham hocks. <laughs> Norm Crosby's on the show, and I've known you a long time, and I still can't figure out how you made it. <laughs> but I worked a lot of small towns with Norm, and it's really true. We worked a lot of those towns where women wear the kind of dresses you can see through, and you don't want to. <laughs> That's right. We played towns with a cab driver wanted you to fix him up with a broad. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, laugh if you want to. We worked those towns. I'll tell you how small they were. The head of the mafia was a Filipino. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You people know what loneliness is. Go to a town when an all-night diner closes two in the afternoon. They think Lawrence Welk's a jazz musician. <laughs> but I'm proud to be here honoring Mill today because he scored more than anybody else on pro basketball. And he's done well on the court, too. And remember the words of a great basketball sage who said, the bigger they are, the more money they make. I like to wish him a lot of luck, Will, because you are the greatest. And I say, you do wish you this luck because with your personality, you're going to need it. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Jackie. You're always good. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to present our man of the week, seven feet full of basketball greatness, Mr. Wilt Chambers. Standing here, I can't help thinking, but civil rights has come a long, long way. <laughs> Twenty years ago, a guy like me wouldn't be allowed to sit today as the guys like you. Those were the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see my old friend, William Shoemaker. You know, Bill wasn't always that short. But when his former wife divorced him, she took his legs as custody. <laughs> and then I think about that you something that belonged to your ex-wife. In your last race, I saw you riding side saddle. <laughs> and Ken Barry, I'm glad you were here. I used to watch his show, Mayberry RFD. After the show, I want to meet you in the parking lot. <laughs> I'm trying to why there was no black spring on your show. <laughs> Mr. George Kennedy, thanks for being here tonight, too. I saw you on that movie made for television, The Great American Tragedy. Well, it showed a little to his title. <laughs> and Dean, I'm really, really proud. You came a long, long way. I remember when you were standing up on the pool hall in Steubenville, Ohio. Same. Hey, want a girl? <laughs> but before I close, I just want to... See, I've been accused of enjoying life. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I admit that drinking and swinging really isn't all of happiness. But it's the closest thing I can think of to it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'd like to finish up by repeating the advice given to you by your Laker coach, Bill Sharman, who said, Wilt, take this basketball and stuff it. <laughs> now, everybody, on the way home, Catherine, now warm up the hot chocolate. <laughs>